Oh, well, thank you very much, David, and quite an honor for me to be here at, at ILCAP and uh, uh, David and Claudia. I'm Bruce Pyanson. I'm an actuary. I'm one of the few non-clinicians here. And uh, uh, what uh, we're going to talk about is quality. We're, we're all live here, so hopefully there's the quality of our presentation will be just really crisp. And... and uh, but uh, the, the issue of quality is something that, that we all know is very important. And as we, we saw uh, this morning with Ricavilla's presentation, that there's elements of quality that are very, very technical dealing with imaging, but it really spans the whole spectrum of everything. And our, our goal is um, uh, for healthcare quality, for screening, our goal for screening is to reduce the mortality of lung cancer. So ultimately, one point of view, the big picture point of view is to uh, say, are we, how are we doing on reaching that goal? Because that's what matters. And But uh, we, we've got a, a terrific panel here. I'll, I'll let our, uh, folks introduce themselves. And then I'm going to pose a couple of an introduction and a background. Sure. Yep. <laughs> introduce. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm Daniel Pachi. Yeah. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist from France, Italy. May I speak now? Or? In a minute. Uh, 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 Stephen Lam. Um, I'm a pulmonologist from Vancouver, Canada. Vicki Beckler. I'm a registered nurse with AstraZeneca and lead the U.S. Lung Ambition Initiative. Ella Kazarini, cardiothoracic radiologist at the University of Michigan, and I chair the American College of Radiology's Lung Cancer Screening Registry, which is focused on lung cancer screening quality. So, we, so we've got an international group. We've got a, 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 a physicians and people who are involved very much in public health and uh, systems. So I think this is a really uh, terrific panel. Uh, just to put this in context, uh, there's there's so many domains of of quality in healthcare, and I put up a few of them here. Um, and a pers it's a US perspective, uh, but I think it's it's pretty general. Uh, we have agencies that, that certify facilities that meet requirements. And I, I put up a toll booth there uh, because very often, you pay money to organizations, the hospital to the Joint Commission for Accreditation of healthcare organizations or, or URAC or other organizations, they come in and inspect the facility and uh, uh, tell you what to fix and you fix it and you get certified. Um, th that's one level of quality control, which is really very much at a process level and not outcomes. Another level is the professional certification. Um, in the US and elsewhere, you know, if you're not a a qualified professional, you're not allowed to perform services. And uh, yeah, I'm showing a, a picture there of the syndics of the Cloth Guild. I think that's the Rembrandt painting, and you know, the guild or union. And that, that comes with certain quality and uh, that's certainly an important aspect uh, of, of the quality infrastructure. Um, there's another set of measures that are perhaps more US oriented, but I think uh, apply to national systems as well, which are is the me certain measurements that are set up. In the US, it's, um, uh, it, it's private organizations like National Commission for Quality Assurance that are pretty significant enterprises of them on their own and generate their revenue by the process of certifying organizations and coming up, coming up with measures for how organizations are performing. And there's, there's, th there's really three categories of uh, subcategories there. Um, one is, is patient outcomes. Um, another is patient satisfaction. And third is process. And, you know, it, in a lot of places, process measures are 
being realized as less important than, than outcomes. What's a process measure? Well, process measure is, you know, check off the box. Did you, did the patient get um, uh, educated? Did you, did you ask the patient if, if they smoke? Check off the box. And that's a process. Whether that benefits the patient or the outcomes or not isn't measured. Just did you do that? Sometimes process measures are pretty important though, like wearing a seatbelt is pretty important. Um, patient satisfaction is a big one. Uh, and finally, there's um, um, my least favorite is the, the eco economist and um, uh, academic approach, which is the quality adjusted life years, which I'm uh, showing is an astrological symbol for that because it's pretty close to astrology or trickle down economic theory or things like that. Um, and that's a, uh, something that is, is hotly debated in the US. So um, here's, um, so here's, there's a couple of things we got to, I, I've warned the, the panelists here, I'm gonna ask their opinions to, to speak on one of these topics or on something else related to quality, which I think uh, a couple of folks are gonna do. Uh, but one is, you know, what, what do they think is really important and a crucial element of quality? The, the technical quality of the CT scan, obviously really important. Um, how about a, another one is the interpretation of the CD scan. IL cap spent a, has spent a lot of time on the first two of these. Um, third is getting a high portion of the eligible people to be screened annually, hopefully. Obviously important for the outcome. Uh, perhaps IL cap spent less time on that aspect, but certainly Others in the audience and in this group are very concerned with that. Um, the, another aspect that certainly has come up in these meetings is what sort of follow-up do you have? You know, you can do perfect screening, you can do uh, perfect interpretation, but if the patient doesn't get good follow-up, and I think that's IL CART is, is really focused on that aspect of quality. Um, and, you know, the the, um, uh, the high portion, uh, so that, that's really combining four and five here. And the fifth one is maybe a quality measure is if we could get a higher portion of people who get lung cancer to be really diagnosed through screening. So here's there, here's six different measures there. There's lots of others to choose from, but uh, I know Dr. Pachi had, has a slide and he would like to talk to them. Thank you. Uh, we are in a new season in this lung cancer screening because uh, we are uh, moving from this one arm study or randomized studies to the programs. And th this means that we need uh, tools in order to assess the impact, early impact of, uh, of the studies and uh, in, in Europe at least, but I think also in the US, this is also a, a something needing uh, an evaluation at the population level. So um, I, I, I think the randomized trials are a, point, a starting point for that. This is a result of the Italang study, which is a small trial, and uh, these are 10 years uh, since the start, uh, for 10 years. And you see the first, what you need at the population level is the differentiation between uh, screen detected, uh, non-screen detected, which means that we have uh, interval cancer or uh, non-participants in the active arm and the other, the control group. As you know, in a program, uh, we don't have the control group. So we have only these two, but as you can see, we have a historical control group or concurrent control group. And we, you see that the screen detected have the characteristic in the lung cancer is quite clear, resected in screen detected is very high, 
in no skin detected it is 20 to 3 percent that's in a population based study as the lung was a stage one 61 versus eight so the first thing if you want to know at the le population level you need to have all this information in order to all the cases in order to this define if they are screen detected or not this is the difference between a randomized trial from a one arm study where you have just the people coming for screening so do, do you think that's a a good measure is the the in this case it looks like about 42 percent or so are screen detected and and the remainder are non-screen detected this is a 10 years period yeah and uh, but, but would this be a four, a four, four years of screening only but would this be a population measure uh, this is a, a the, is measure? the population measure that we will need in the future program okay so so you're using this as an example of of a representation of, of yeah. how we look at quality. And I think you're- But as you can see that the non-screen detected has almost very similar to the control arm. So what really is necessary is to pick up people at screening. Otherwise we are, it's very different from breast cancer. In breast cancer, a completely different situation. In lung cancer, we are in a very awful situation. <laughs> and uh, at population level, the proportion of resected is very low in the absence of screening. So this must change. This must change is the first object. And this can be done in and two years. Let, let me uh, cut you off. I know there's other, there's other uh, uh, opinions. Anyone else wanna uh, either address Dr. Coley's comment or present? I just want to make a comment that quality measures are depending on the lens that you're looking at measures through. And what you're speaking about is the, the lens that you would look at from a state or a country level cancer control organization, where if you're going to implement screening, you want to make sure that you're seeing a state shift and that you're seeing the right people getting screened. So those measures at a population level by high level health department type organizations are going to look different than process and quality measures in an operation than patient-centered outcomes. So the quality measures are going to be different depending on the lens. And I think population measures are important for those who endorse and support screening at a cancer control level. Well, of course, if I speak, for example, in breast cancer now, we do this exercise for subtypes. We, the, we have the herb positive or herb negative cases. At this point, it's extremely difficult to have in a population consideration like that because the proportion of resected, the proportion of stage is very low. So, Vicky, you, your program is, is more at the... Yeah. yeah, so my lens, the way I look at this is from a very different lens. I don't look at it from the lens of a scientific researcher or publications or studies that are out there. I look at it from the lens of real world experience, boots on the ground, working with hundreds of centers across the country, doing this and building a really large high volume screening program and been in this space for a very long time. And I'll tell you, you know, when I think of quality measures, the things that were really important to us and that are really important to organizations that are trying to build programs. And I look at it in really two big buckets. You know, one is overall outcomes and adherence and everything else kind of falls one or the other. And I think when it comes to quality, you know, those are the things that are really important. We, from a center's perspective is, how are we making a difference? And success or failure, you know, not just quality in the terms of qualitative or quantitative data, but also quality in measuring the actual clinical pathways and protocols that are put in place to manage the patients. Because the reality is the success and failure of every program, regardless if it's screening through uh, traditional lung cancer screening or an IPN program, your success or failure of that, really the, the root of that is in your process and your pathways, whether they stand you up for success 
or they set you up for failure. And so they have to be lean, they have to be efficient, they have to be population-based approach. And my challenge to every organization has always been, look at what you're doing for mammography. And the reality is, you know, this is Vicki's world of rainbows and butterflies, but the, the reality is we really should be screening twice as many people for lung cancer. Whatever your, your mammography rate is, we should be meeting that or well exceeding it. And so it's kind of my thought. <laughs> Do we have your slide, even? Um, so I look at quality indicators in three categories. So the traditional programmatic functioning indicators are in the center, um, the middle uh, bucket, like looking at things like participation rate, the retention rate after uh, people have taken part in the screening program, uh, the early recall rates, and the, the positive predictive value of people who are sent for a diagnostic workup, the cancer detection rate, and the time to diagnostic workup or time to treatment, um, and um, and the interval cancer rate and and the smoking cessation rate. Um, so, just along the lines of Bruce's uh, um, question, there's also uh, indicators of how impactful the screening program is. So, we also want to look at the um, the complication, the potential harms versus the potential benefit. So we would like to look at the, uh, the benign resection rate, complication rate from um, the diagnostic workup or, or treatment, uh, looking at uh, some of the beneficial uh, effects of screening, like uh, the state shift, uh, the cancer specific, lung cancer specific mortality reduction, and the disability at just light years. I just want to make one point about the interval cancer rate. If you look at a PLCO study, the, uh, looking at chest X-ray versus usual care, the interval cancer rate is actually very high. And the majority of them have stage three and four lung cancers. And that may be one reason why it contributed to the lack of mortality and benefit reduction with chest X-ray that we discussed yesterday. So I just want to s spend the last couple of minutes uh, one, uh, on the screening uptake, uh, spinning off from the programmatic functioning because screening uptake is actually a uh, little bit different with lung screening compared to the other screening program, like mammography, where we screen everyone about a certain age group. Um, so very easy to get the denominator. But for lung cancer screening, we're talking about high risk screening. So you have to define what you mean by high risk, traditionally using EMR to look at uh, um, the age and pack years. Uh, the data quality is questionable, uh, how the smoking history is obtained. Uh, and another point is the fact is you have a high smoking area. It doesn't mean all the cancer is coming from there. Just give you an example from northern part of British Columbia. We have very high smoking rate, but only 8% of lung cancers are coming from there. So people, people die younger of other diseases. And so there are not a lot of lung cancers coming out from that area. So I think we look. We need to look at what kind of denominator. Um, the how do we count it? So I just want to offer one solution, um, uh, more in line with what uh, uh, Vicky covered a little bit earlier in her uh, in her talk. I think we should look at prospectively people with newly diagnosed lung cancer patients as to who these people are and what proportion of them actually meet the screening criteria. So well, whether they're never smokers, uh, former smokers, do they meet the US task force criteria? If you use the risk prediction model, what proportion of people actually meet the screening uh, criteria? So, and also where these people are coming from, uh, whether they're from a socially deprived area, so we can target our screening effort to, to those areas that where a lot of lung cancer patients coming from um, and, uh, and who they are. Um, I think this is the power of the geospatial mapping that, that you show because we can uh, kind of refresh the map over time uh, to see how we are doing in terms of uh, uh, screening uptake in those areas uh, that have high cancer incidence and whether the stage shift actually occur uh, in those areas and ultimately the mortality reduction. Um, I think we have to be careful before we pat our shoulder on uh, the, the decrease in mortality over time after implementation of screening, because of there are other things that compete with screening, like incidental lung screening program, people may want to bypass screening because they, 
they don't want to bother with uh, decision sharing or smoking cessation that takes time and don't get reimbursed uh, by, uh, by the funding programs. Uh, and also the incidental um, uh, uh, ad hoc screening. I think it's also another thing we have to consider. Uh, so if we do what we are uh, looking at the newly diagnosed lung cancer patient, we can actually sort out that the contribution of screening versus some of these other sources that may also contribute to reduction in lung cancer mortality. Uh, thank you. I, I, I wanted, uh, I think several of you had mentioned the difference between lung cancer screening and mammography. And I know, uh, Dr. Coley, you, you had mentioned that, but didn't, could you elaborate? I, I think you mentioned it, but I cut you off probably. The, I think the difference is, is quite big now. Maybe in the 70s, mammography was in a similar situation. And now is that the difference is that you have a very uh, high proportion of no, unresected, a, a quite high proportion of stages, high, late stage. So, in my opinion, uh, okay, you have to define the target because uh, we have a problem of cost, but uh, I think we have to change the pattern of care of lung cancer for, for everybody uh, suffering from lung cancer because uh, it's absolutely true we have to Spontaneously, this did not happen at the, in 30 years. We started 20 years ago, the situation was already the same. So there, there is no spontaneous change of the pattern of care. Only with screening we are able to change. Or uh, screening or uh, uh, diagnostic anticipation some way. <laughs> other way. And so this is uh, the major point because if we change the pattern of care, then the attitude toward the disease is changing. That's what happened with the breast cancer. So you're saying that the, the, he, this is the, uh, the opportunity we have with screening to change the, is the key to changing the pattern of care. It's already changed in mammography. In, in breast cancer, I started in the seventies. Breast cancer was a killing disease, and today, no. the women speak about breast cancer because they know Do you want to they, go back. It's an important disease. Is also killing, but no more so threatening as it was 30 years ago. Do you ago. want to go back? You, I think we skipped over a slide of yours. Do you want to go back to that? Sorry? Did we skip a slide that you had? Did we miss a slide? Uh, <laughs> you can't, yeah. Oh, could, could we go back? Uh, but I don't but, want to... But in, in the, while, while we're waiting... For that, uh, Dr. Kazaruni, I know there, you're involved is, in, there, there is in, uh, in the, the metrics and measures for lung cancer screening. Could you describe that? So, talking a little bit about kind of process measures or the quality of the delivery of care measures, I think is really important. And that involves both the quality of the patient education that happens around shared decision making and is it effective? And are your, is your practice performing effectively in shared decision-making compared to other practices? Because if you don't reach out to and are able to bring people through education, then you have a failure coming in the door. And so I think that's a very important gate coming into lung cancer screening is to be able to educate people to understand the value of screening so that they come for screening, but they also have buy-in for screening should they need to proceed through a diagnostic pathway, should they need to come back for an interval scan or a biopsy and to make sure they understand the value of coming back for annual screening. So I think the quality of lung cancer screening starts with the very first step, which is the education that is given to patients and engaged within patients to understand what screening is. And mammography has several decades of experience. It is a commonly spoken about screening test over cocktails at the soccer fields. It's an accepted population level screening that people understand. Lung cancer screening, not so much. Um, issues with stigma, 
nihilism that there's no hope even if I were to have a screen detected cancer. There are social cultural issues around lung cancer screening that prevent people from coming forward from screening, from even being willing to engage in understanding about lung cancer screening. So, so how, I think it's how would you measure the quality of that? So one way to measure the quality of the intake process, if you will, for screening is if you've defined your patient population and your uptake is low, then you're probably not meeting the gate of being able to educate the population that you're trying to reach. So you, part of your, um, if you've defined the population and only 10% are coming in for screening, you probably have a problem up front in your starting gate to be able to bring people up front. So I think you can measure that in the percentage. One of the measures is the percentage of your eligible people coming in for screening. And if you're trying to problem solve, what's your problem? Are you not identifying the right people? Are you not educating well enough? Um, and you can um, use decision aids and just simple tools to, to get information from patients about the experience in lung cancer screening. Now, now you, you, you heard Dr. Lamb uh, um, uh, express skepticism about the, the denominator. And, it, uh, and maybe, maybe the US uh, EMRs are much better than the ones in Vancouver. Probably not, um, but what, what's what? Yeah, so I would I agree with Stephen that the electronic health records are are poor at recording smoking history, and part of the reason they're poor at it is because we do a poor job of the way we ask patients about their smoking history. So it all starts with who's asking and how they're asking. If they don't understand why it's important to hit a twenty pack year threshold for screening, they're not gonna be as good at understanding whether it's under or over 20. It doesn't really matter if it's 50 or 55 or 60, it's that what's the entry level. And if, if the person taking that smoking history doesn't understand why that 20 is important, then they're not gonna do a good job at delivering a, sm a smoking history. So we're trying to work with EHR vendors and through the HEDIS measure development for lung cancer screening, a very important part of that is tobacco history documentation and working with EHR vendors to try and improve the way that's done. But it's not just the tool, EHR, it's the people who ask the questions that also need to improve, the education. And I'd like to add something to what Ella was saying earlier that I think is really important from a quality perspective of measuring the quality of your program it has a lot to do with not, um, not let's see, leveraging the power of your conversion rates. If, if physicians are referring patients to your program and you're only screening a certain percentage of those referrals, it goes back. Look at what your processes are. What is your intake process? Are you overcomplicating this? Are you making it too difficult in adding barriers to this when it comes to shared decision-making? And there are really, it's, it, we way overcomplicate this process. And there's enough barriers. We don't need to add to it. And if you've got a process in place where a physician, and granted, I'm not a physician, but I'm going to tell you, if I was a physician and I had a conversation with a patient about lung cancer screening and I referred them for screening, and now my patient is being made to take time off to have another conversation with a dedicated mid-level, and then they require them to make another day off to have a CT scan, I'd be insulted to say, I'm not competent enough to have this conversation with my patient. I, it just, it's, it's mind boggling to me. And this is happening everywhere. And we want to know why we are having issues with uptake. You know, let's not add to the problem. Let's try to identify root cause the problem and solve for it and not overcomplicate a process. It shouldn't be that complicated. So Vicki, I think that would be your number one. Number one, if you had to pick one thing that to measure quality, it would be keep it. It keep it simple. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, we, you know. If so we, how, we, and, and how would you, that, say, okay. how, how would you measure that? I'm going to ask you, everyone else yeah. to pick one thing that you, yeah. would, well, you would measure if, if you want. I, so going back to that though, I want to point this out. If you think about it, that like that model is not an unusual model in the U.S., that model is perpetuating stigma because really what we're saying is you're not smart enough. In spite of already talking to your physician, you're not smart enough to make this decision on your own. And that's perpetuating stigma. 
So just one thing to think about when you're putting the processes in place. But I think measuring it, you know, that what I just said there is, is, a, is an easy one, looking at your referrals. Now, granted, we can always have more referrals, but if you've got a oh, so that's of like referrals, a time or conversion? number of steps or time. Anyone else want to pick one? I, I would pick um, adherence to um, adherence to screening and screening diagnostics, including timeliness. So once you've gotten people in the door and you've gotten them through this, this first part and you've gotten them into a screening program, you have a recommendation. Are they coming back for annual screening? Are they coming back for that three month interval CT? If they aren't, why not? Um, what's causing delays? Do you have socioeconomic barriers, childhood barriers, transportation issues? Trying to understand why your patients do and don't come back and to address the adherence to the, the, the treatment, the, the diagnostic paradigms and annual screening and the timeliness of coming. That'd be, my, that'd be second after first. You can have to. That's. Dr. Lee. <laughs> if I have to pick one, I would stick to the screening uptake that is defined by asking every newly diagnosed lung cancer patients, have you ever heard about screening? Uh, then you, you know a, a lot about how your screening program is working. If you find very few people heard about screening or, uh, or they have lung cancer before they, they get treated for lung cancer, we, have, we, we do not uh, meet our goal. Uh, Dr. Cole. Uh, yes, I think uh, probably we have at least three areas of- no, We only get two. Quality, no, One. quality, no. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, recruitment, performance, and outcome, early outcomes. Rec recruitment, uh, how you collect the population, who, who you collect, uh, so who uh, is invited for screening. Second, do you have uh, the performance of screening? And third, you have the early outcome of screening. And uh, each of them had complexity in the, for the evaluation. My point is if you don't pick up cases at screening, uh, all is a waste. So uh, outcome uh, evaluation early and early cases at screening are essential in order to, to be effective. Well, well, there you have it. We have time for one question, maybe two. Can we go? Um, no, it's, it's not that slide. It's a slide that showed that slide there. You have one NSD, uh, and only six of those were interval camp. What are the other 47? Are those patients that, that, that there are also no participants in the in the no screen detected? There are interval and no screen detect in, and non participant because in invite in the active group a proportion of the invited group is not is also followed for a long time and uh, it can have a, a cancer uh, after four or five years from the beginning. So I would say that the the, the quality index there that's very clear is that you have to continue annual screening. Uh, all of these 45 cases uh, are, in, are in advanced stage uh, because they were no longer screened. Screening had stopped. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, the, 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 one of the important that, 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 that's quality that. indexes is annual screening. I just want to make a comment in general that it's great to define quality measures so that we can look consistently across programs and countries and what we're doing, but it's also important to help people address when their quality fails. And I think in general, we don't do a great job of educating people of how to look at their own data to then go through a plan, like a plan, do, study, act cycle to understand why they're failing. So one of the things that we've done at the ACRS and Cancer Screening Registry is we pick three topics, smoking cessation and screening, adherence to screening and screening diagnostics, and radiation dose as, the, as three measures. And we developed basically a toolkit for each one to help people look at their smoking cessation setting screening data. If it's not, if it's not where it should be and understand what questions to ask, who to put on your team, 
So you can get your smoking cessation rate up and your smoking cessation offerings up. Same thing with radiation dose and same thing with adherence to screening because people go to work and they deliver clinical care and they don't often stop to look at their quality and then figure out how to address it. So creating simple educational tools to get your adherence up, to get your return to screening up, I think are really important to help people make a difference in their quality measures. So we got to set them, but we've also got to help people get to them. Thank you very much. I, I like Steve's measure. You ask every lung cancer patient in your hospital, did you know about screening and why didn't you get screening? That gives you a very good indication of exactly where to go and recruit those people to. So I, I think that's a wonderful measure for each hospital. Well, can be collected. Thank, thank you all very much. You, you've heard some real practitioners and some practical advice uh, for, for how to improve screening. Thank you.